Good morning. Welcome to the final conference of the Open CCCP project. We are now in Planta Uno in L'Hospitalet in Barcelona with some of the participants here sharing our space and some of the participants also abroad in uh, different countries. Um, Open CCCP is a project funded by the Erasmus Plus, the U European Commission, and developed by five organizations of, from five different countries. Uh, Bond of Union from Palermo, Italy, Alternative Sociale uh, from Iași, Romania, uh, City Mind from London, UK, Tessere from Berlin, Germany, and Transit Pro Projectas from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, the project Open CCCP is, is a project that has last um, two and a half years and it's focused on the creation of open educational practices applied to the use of heritage in local communities to promote social inclusion. Um, we have developed a methodology, we have developed uh, a curriculum, we have done different labs, we will explain this briefly. Um, but the idea today is to share some, uh, some ideas and some results and also to discuss around this open um, educational practices. The conference will start with a brief presentation of the results of the project. Then uh, we will share a round table called Open Resources for Heritage Making. And then we will share the experiences of the participants in uh, the labs in the different countries. Um, I hope you enjoy it and uh, make the most out of it. I now give the floor to Oscar Martinez to start presenting the results of this uh, project. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. I'm Oscar Martinez from Transit Projectas. I am presenting the first result of the project, the, the um, comprehensive model for open educational practices. One of the main objectives of the project is uh, uh, change the way how we learn and improve our skills and competences during our labor life. Also, uh, or we are, are not uh, in active uh, work. Um, the project starts with a research for educational framework that's uh, flexible, adaptive, and inclusive. Um, the result is a comprehensive model for open educational practice because uh, with this, uh, we explain how to open educational resources is a, good, a great way and a great opportunity to mix the um, face-to-face -face and uh, open educational resources uh, online uh, context. Um, we mix this to concrete the theory and the practices. Um, and the way uh, uh, is the, the open educational uh, the open educational framework are um, downloadable for our website, uh, openccp.eu and is based on open learning design. Open learning design have three pillars, the engagement, why uh, we learn, representation, uh, what we learn, and action and expression, uh, how we learn. And we develop a methodology uh, uh, called uh, local training lab. Uh, it's uh, laboratory for training uh, people who work uh, with uh, communities, uh, people uh, on social projects. Um, and now I pass the 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 voice to Jim to explain the EO2. Sure. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Can everybody hear me all right? So, um, as Oscar was explaining, there's a, um, the attempt we tried to make was the, uh, bring online learning back to, back to reality, back to uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, particularly disadvantaged neighborhoods. That was the onset. Uh, we wanted to do so by means of three 
tools, I imagine. The first tool explained by, by Oscar is the comprehensive model. Second tool is a curriculum. And the third tool is what Alex will explain later is a compendium. I think what um, worked quite well for me is that um, uh, first we um, looked for a way that people who want to learn give them the tools, the signposts that they can learn, that they can find the way. So in the end, um, we the, the curriculum is the most hands-on bit of that. It, it actually takes you by the hand and leads you to a result. And it does so for me in, in three steps. There's an, an aligning actors step where uh, you explore a neighborhood, you analyze a neighborhood, uh, get to know a context and get to know people you want to work with. So that's first. Uh, step two is designing a plan, a local action plan to do something together. And step three uh, would then be the implementation and in the end, where possible, certify skills uh, of that process, which is quite unusual, I think, very ambitious. Um, we have put those three steps with modules of, with how-tos and with concrete things online. So that's a perfect loop from OER to OEP back to OER. Um, but they are on uh, openccp.eu, where you can find in the tools section, everything I just said. And I pass on to Alex. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me. <clears throat> um, um, this project has been a great learning experience for the participants. Uh, and we also wanted to make sure that this learning experience is shared with, with, uh, with uh, everybody. So it, it becomes in itself um, an open resource. Um, and we put this experience into several, several uh, deliverables, several um, publications, but one of the um, the publications that kind of gathers everything and uh, explain how to put things into practice is the compendium. The compendium is a collection of of plans of actions uh, that we developed in uh, each of the participating countries. It's uh, uh, it, it it contains plans of actions. Um, related to improving the lives of vulnerable groups uh, and of communities in general. Uh, based on our own experiences, we, we, each organization does, um, uh, has own approaches and each organization um, learned how to adjust these approaches uh, to make them more effective, but also to be able to adapt, more adaptive, uh, to, to allow us as organizations to become more adaptive towards uh, emergency situations such as the COVID pandemic. So um, the, the compendium includes uh, our experience um, and our, um, we give some, some uh, examples on how uh, the resources developed in the project can be applied, but also it's also a testimony on how you can adapt um, to uh, hardships brought in by, by the pandemic. Uh, you will find 15 uh, such plans focusing on uh, uh, providing uh, support to, uh, and assistance to vulnerable groups, to find vulnerable individuals, or focusing on regenerating communities and focusing on using the resources that the community already has in order to improve the lives of, of, of the community and of individuals in particular. So I, uh, I very much I, um, um, advise that you uh, find the, the compendium on, on the website. You will also find how we created those plans of actions, how the local labs were implemented. So we propose the local labs as a suggestion for you to improve your work, but also the plans of actions as a way to expand your ways or in approaches uh, related to how uh, you can improve the resilience of communities and individuals. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jim, Oscar, and uh, Alex. As you see, it, it's a very brief presentation of, of what we have done in two and a half years. There are very interesting uh, results in the website, so we encourage you to visit the website and see what we have done. And um, as Alex said, it has been a very, um, it, we have learned a lot between the participants, between the partnership, between the consortium, and also we have tried to um, give these this tools and this, and this learning to other organizations and other individuals to, who participated in the, in the local labs. Uh, we hope you, you, can, you can see the material and you can enjoy it because we um, are convinced it is, it is uh, 
interesting and it's very useful. Um, we will have one minute to connect to uh, the participants of the following table. So um, we will start in one minute the uh, round table um, open resources for heritage making who uh, the table would be uh, moderated by Lorenzo uh, from Tessere uh, Berlin and the participants will be online uh, speaking from Barcelona uh, from uh, and from Berlin um, so just keep two minutes patience while we move and uh, connect again thank you So uh, thank you, Mariana, Oscar, and uh, all the team at Transit Projectors for providing us this uh, great opportunity to discuss together the results of uh, the Open CCCP project and also the possible connection and uh, um, let's say further uh, development of uh, topics and themes we have been uh, uh, discussing together. I have uh, now uh, the um, task somehow to um, uh, coordinate a discussion on some of the topics that we have been uh, uh, touching with this project uh, with uh, a few guests that we invited uh, um, for the, the, the connection that they have with the topic. First of all, I want to um, somehow uh, point on two key uh, aspects that this project has uh, uh, touched during this year that we tried to uh, somehow concentrate in the title that we gave to this uh, uh, open uh, uh, round, Open Resources for Heritage Making. The first theme, the first uh, key word here, Open Resources, regards uh, the increasing uh, need for uh, capturing uh, uh, knowledge and capacities that come from the territory. There is a shift that we have in the, uh, let's say, professional work of people working on territories, transforming spaces in uh, from, from a knowledge, uh, uh, let's say, an expert knowledge that is formed in universities and in institutions uh, about how things need to be done to the uh, consciousness of the fact that uh, uh, local communities, uh, uh, territories, they are, uh, they capture a lot of knowledge and capacity. They have a, a, a strong uh, um, uh, richness of uh, um, skills and resources that can be used uh, for improving the local uh, uh, dimension, the capacity of local community for empowered community. So uh, there is uh, uh, an essential uh, attention among professionals during the last years in what we uh, call the situated learning, the capacity to learn from local communities, to uh, uh, support communities in create their solutions, in understanding their uh, local context and provide by themselves the, uh, the part of the resources at least that uh, uh, exist um, that are available. So it is extremely important to develop this uh, um, uh, richness of resources in an open form that can provide uh, local communities with tools and uh, um, potentiality for improve their uh, situation. Uh, Open CCCP has been working on this, on how we can transfer the knowledge which is um, available also in the network in digital form that is open to the communities into actual practices because the other aspect that came from this situation is the need for uh, uh, basically adapting and uh, uh, recreating uh, uh, those tools in any different given context. Uh, the second term that uh, came uh, in, in uh, our uh, project, uh, very strong, is that one of heritage. And in this case, we are talking about heritage making. I think there is a parallel shift uh, to the one about knowledge building, 
which is uh, in the concept of heritage making. The idea that heritage is not like it was in the, in the classic uh, 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 practice about preserving even by, by institutions from a top-down perspective. It's rather more uh, uh, a process that happen in communities and territories in terms of developing their value and creating uh, understanding what is uh, uh, what are the important value on the territories and basically uh, transform appropriate themselves so this is the concept of heritage making which is uh, increasingly also uh, moving into the idea of dissonant heritage something that is conflictual that is part of a, a processual discourse about appropriating or rejecting certain values, which is extremely important. Okay, I think I spoke uh, even too much uh, so far. That's just to introduce the guest that we invited to discuss with us that uh, somehow uh, may help us uh, to discuss a little bit those uh, different perspectives and different way to, to look at uh, open resources and heritage making. We invited uh, today to talk with us uh, Levente Poliak which is an urban planner, a researcher, a community advocate, and a policy advisor. He has worked on urban regeneration programs in New York, Paris, Rome, Vienna, Budapest. Uh, he works as an expert of, uh, for the Urbact project in urban networks like uh, Temporary Use, a tool for urban regeneration, interactive cities, active NGOs, and also as an expert for the Urban Innovative Action Project. Um, and uh, his uh, basically uh, task and competence is designing learning trajectories uh, for exchange among cities. Uh, Levente Poliak is also a co-founder of Eutropian, which is a group of researchers, urban policy experts, citizens and initiatives advocates that are specialists in urban regeneration, cultural development, community participation, local economic and policy development. Um, then we have invited with us Elena Ananiaidu, uh, which is an uh, historian museologist from Greece that currently works in uh, Barcelona and is a collaborator of the Museum of History of Migration of Catalonia. Um, and she works in public program development and as a member of a digital projects production team. The Museum of the History of Immigration in Catalonia is a permanent exhibition that offers uh, the public a view on human history in the process of migration from prehistory to the 21st century, but has also a regular program of activities and temporary exhibitions uh, taking the migra migration for um, various subject areas um, where the multiculturalism is the axis that structure the dialogue between museum and its users. Finally, we invited also Laura Colini, uh, which is uh, uh, an urbanist. Uh, she is a PhD in urban regional environmental design. Uh, her most recent work covers topics related to uh, EU urban policies, urban inequalities, inclusion of migrants and refugees, housing and financialization. Currently, she works as a senior policy ad expert on social and urban policies for the EU uh, uh, project like Urbact Uya and in particular for the urban agenda for culture and cultural heritage, uh, which is a partnership uh, coordinated by Germany and Italy, uh, uh, which works on the topic of culture and cultural heritage in uh, Europe. Unfortunately, Laura is in this moment uh, uh, busy in another meeting, but we will join us uh, for the discussion before the uh, end of the discussion. So at this point, um, I would like uh, to um, give the floor to our invitees. I will uh, su suggest to start uh, with Levente because uh, uh, I will propose a first, uh, let's say, question and reflection that involves especially the concept of ownership in the heritage definition. This idea of heritage making that we uh, have been uh, um, in 
introducing now somehow it's also uh, strongly centered on the idea of reclaiming uh, uh, the public uh, ownership uh, even in terms of the commons as a community resource from the point of view of the people and I know that Lemente in this moment is also uh, uh, involved in a super interesting uh, uh, Horizon 2020 project called Open Heritage which uh, works uh, basically on uh, cooperative uh, uh, forms of managing heritage as a resource for community. Levente, we are very curious to, to yes. hear from you. Thank you, Lorenzo, and, and uh, thanks a lot for having us. It's a, it's a great uh, uh, panel, so I'm really curious to hear also uh, everyone else. Uh, so maybe a few words about open heritage, because I think it's an interest, interesting uh, starting point to talk about ownership, because in open heritage, we, we look at uh, uh, different elements of how uh, heritage regeneration, regeneration or adaptive reuse can happen. Uh, we talk about community involvement, territorial impact, financial integration, uh, and of course the heritage value. And so we talk about ownership in two different levels. We talk about ownership at the symbolical level in the, in the sense of who's involved, who has a, a say uh, in how you know heritage should be reused or uh, valued or interpreted. And then we also talk about uh, actually the legal formats of, of ownership and also all the decision making processes that are coming with it now, because what we've seen is that, uh, of course, uh, in the public realm, we have a lot of reg uh, heritage projects, heritage regeneration projects. But um, I'm, sp I'm speaking now from Budapest, Hungary, and, and we can see that the the, the public sphere or the actions of the public sphere, they don't always reflect public interest, no? Uh, and, and I'm being very, you know, very soft now on, on, on how uh, public institutions can actually detour uh, and hijack uh, the notion of public interest and, and, and also public use, no? So what we realized uh, also before Open Heritage, and Open Heritage is, is a bit uh, building on this, is that there has been a lot of attempts from different kinds of communities to also reclaim the idea of, of uh, public interest, but also the reclaim uh, heritage as a, as, as, a, as a shared, you know, as, 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 a, you know, as an object or a, or a, or a theme, a place, uh, a notion that is owned not by public institutions, but owned by communities. So as you mentioned, Lorenzo, the Commons has been, I think, a very important tool, or actually maybe not a tool, but a, a framework to think about these, these uh, assets. You know, again, still we talk about uh, tangible and intangible heritage as well. But more precisely, in, in open heritage, we look at uh, buildings and building complexes that are being reused by, by communities. And it's always uh, uh, also thinking about uh, the legal ownership as well. So who owns, who, who is actually the legally the owner of these buildings um, or spaces? It is uh, public ownership, but, uh, you know, managed in a public civic uh, collaboration. It is uh, private ownership, but uh, shared ownership where there's no uh, you know, speculation possible. So there's no money made on the on the individual ownership side but uh, maybe those profits are created but they are reinvested into the into the the, the the given heritage space so we've been exploring a bit different notions of, of ownership and, and later on i can tell you more more details about it but i think we we have to talk about ownership on different levels and and uh, on the on the symbolic level uh, of course it's it's very much about uh, you know attachment and it's very much about a community that might be a local community as you mentioned lorenzo but it can be also kind of a, a virtual global community i can uh, think of uh, uh, of uh, the island of uh, uh, Pove Pove uh, Poveia in venice that was the last publicly owned island that was about to be sold to private investor and local community got mobilized to to um, to actually buy this island for the community to you know not make not have another island with another hotel but have a, a green space kind of a central park of, uh, of of venice and and uh, this they invited the global community that in a way thinks with venice or, or thinks about venice uh, to to join in 
uh, you know, founding this this bid, no? So they they crowdfunded a lot of money and they had a lot of supporters uh, across the world, which means that their community, the community uh, of Coveya as a heritage site, is more than than people in Venice. It's actually a global community, and we could we could mention a lot of things, uh, social housing, uh, crowdfunding in Barcelona, and all kinds of things. So. We talk about different levels of communities as well, who is involved in uh, in thinking about heritage, in uh, mobilizing resources to protect the heritage and, and also to develop heritage spaces. Thank you very much, uh, Levente. Yes, uh, there are several interesting points coming out from your uh, uh, um, at all from your words, but I'd like uh, at this point to to use this this uh, uh, key of ownership uh, mm -hmm. for uh, uh, um, asking uh, also um, to Elena uh, about uh, a particularly let's say extreme perspective in terms of ownership when we represent. Uh, people like uh, migrants, people that basically are not uh, uh, settled, uh, based, but represent somehow the, the transient uh, identity of our cities. How can we include the, uh, their uh, uh, identity? How can we basically manage for those voices in terms of representing also heritage into the city? Yeah, hello, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me, inviting the museum, actually, uh, here in the talk. So, yeah, I, my, what I'm going to say, actually, is from the perspective of a local museum uh, in San Andrea de Bezos, a, a, a municipality outside Bar uh, near Barcelona, um, that uh, we are actually not using that much the the concept of ownership because as we are working with more intangible heritage it's a more vague term to define the ownership of uh, identities and uh, narratives but uh, we use uh, we use terms to conceptualize our work as a representation participation authorship and what we are trying to do is co-define a common heritage uh, for the local territory that we are part of. So practically the museum promotes these processes, bringing together groups of people, groups from the surroundings uh, that, uh, that gather different views and uh, different life knowledge. It hands over the spaces, it, the museum space to them and its tools that are mostly narrative tools. So in our case, uh, the context is uh, very important because in a sense, it, what, it is what brings everything, it unites everything together. So I would like to just uh, mention a project that uh, it is an ongoing exhibition and educational project that may illustrate uh, the conversation. Uh, the project is called Nomes Danada, or One Way Ticket in English, and it, take, it takes its name from a, from a work of an Italian poet that was the inspiration of a, of, a, of a painter that participated as a central artist in the exhibition. So the thing is that when this exhibition arrived in the museum, that was like an artistic vision and reflection for the reality of crossing the sea to find refugee. Uh, what we wanted to do is contextualize uh, this vision and enhance it with, uh, local, with local experiences and realities through the educational program. So what we did was uh, to work with a local institute, a local school, uh, from a neighborhood that uh, has a strong background of migration movements that was configured by the migration movements. Uh, and also with a group of uh, young, um, young people, young migrants that ha have the, the status of unaccompanied uh, migrants, uh, recently arrived in Barcelona and living in a residential uh, center. 
Uh, so the school has a great experience in working with the neighborhood and with the families and uh, and gathering testimonies to learn from them. And uh, they developed like a mapping of these movements in their own context and their emotional imprint. And then we also organized several workshops for the, the young boys from the residential center, photographic workshops, and then the next year, uh, corporal expression workshops to try to commune, to help them, give them the, the tools, the artistic tools and expression tools to communicate uh, their life experience uh, into a wider public sphere, as you were mentioning. So yeah, basically all these materials were finally exhibited together and presented by all three actors together, the artist, the institute, and the boys. And uh, the idea behind that is uh, precisely to try to define uh, what is called common heritage and to convert the visitors into heritage actors uh, or to people that participate and contribute with content and contribute by creating uh, narratives. And basically, yeah, that that would be it. Okay. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, I think that um, this experience of the museum mediating uh, uh, between um, communities, migrant, uh, uh, in uh, let's say expert and non-expert knowledge brings us to one question that I think it's extremely uh, important in this context, which is the role, the, the, let's say the new professional roles that are emerging on the territories, the one that we can call community activators or territorial activators that are uh, becoming extremely essential in the transformative process that we see in the city in this moment. Uh, how basically we can connect different knowledge, different background in order to work on developing commons. Um, what are the skills and professional tools that are needed to manage such processes? This is what we tried with uh, um, uh, the Open CCGP to work to develop some curriculum uh, in enhancing the, the, the capacity of new professional figures able to work in this edge field between social planning uh, work, uh, um, creativity, art, uh, cultural work, uh, uh, and so on. I'd like to bring this question to both of you, Levente and uh, Elena, uh, what do you think are the, the, the needs for such new professional figures? What is the kind of uh, knowledge that we need to develop for this scope? Elena, do you want to start or should I start? No, start. Okay, so I, I think it's, it's very interesting that uh, when, when we look at who are, who are the protagonists, because of course, you know, we can call this a new professional, we can call this uh, a lot of skills that were uh, present in different professions and and when i in five six years ago i was writing my my phd and then i looked at uh, a few cities across europe that were doing uh, regeneration projects and and i realized that there's a kind of a scene of these uh, in, in some places it's called spatial developers or special entrepreneurs in other places it's urban pioneers there's all city makers, there's all kinds of uh, denominations, but uh, very often they come from very specific scenes, like uh, for some reason in Budapest, where I am right now, and where I was very active uh, in the early 2010s, it's, it's theater. It's the theater profession that had the skills somehow to organize people around spaces and, and to build the communities around that, because it's about orchestrating people. It's about, uh, you know, adapting spaces for very different kinds of uses. So it was pretty much theater, people coming from theater who started to, who did the most interesting, uh, let's say, heritage projects uh, in, in town. In the same time, in uh, in Holland, this, this was really much led by architects because the architect profession was very much interested in finding new fields uh, for that. 
in Rome, where I lived for a few years uh, until recently, it's been activists, it's been civic activists uh, that were very active in, in reclaiming uh, uh, spaces and also very politicized civic activists uh, reclaim, reclaiming spaces uh, for community use in, in Berlin. Uh, as you know more than I do, Lorenzo, it, it's been very much a nightlife that actually, in a way, matured and, and knowing how to run spaces and how to, you know, attract communities, they they started to develop things that were not about nightlife and consumption anymore, but, you know, new services for the city and very often doing this in, in heritage spaces. And also, it's very interesting, what are the skills that you can... Uh, you can you can find in in these very different fields or very different scenes or professions and in the end I think uh, in the I, I think there is a need for this new uh, of course these new skills to be brought together I don't know how easy it it is to to teach because I guess a big part of uh, uh, and I know there are now master programs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but in a way, I guess one of the, the biggest, the most important skill is uh, devotion and, uh, and engagement, which is not a, not a technical skill, but it's something that you, uh, either you feel close to this project or not, and, and uh, either you are you know, ready to put in a lot of unpaid hours or not. So, and then, of course, there's a prof professionalization uh, path as well. So I guess uh, a lot of people who learn uh, by doing in one place, and they they already have the the professional, let's say, credentials to to also uh, develop new spaces or go to new places and 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 teach other people. But I think it's it's still uh, kind of um, some of these skills are coming from the most unexpected places sometimes. And and uh, yeah, so I think it's it's a quite an interesting phenomenon that uh, the same things are done by different people in different countries. Thank you. Elena, will you add something? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, at first, I totally agree with uh, Levante <laughs> in the sense that uh, basically th these are skills that, uh, at least in my generation, we weren't learning them in the schools, in the universities, etc. But it's more like a life experience, interests, um, well, skills in a sense of social skills, communication. Uh, because finally in projects like that you don't build upon knowledge, uh, I mean written knowledge, or, but you build upon the communication and the capacity to, to, to build a common narrative. And uh, yeah, in, in our case uh, we were working, we are working with uh, on the one side with local actors, but then as mediators and facilitators, uh, we work with uh, people from different disciplines, uh, for example, artists, uh, because we are trying to use the tools they have, the artistic tools, in order to, to build a testimony that is not necessarily verbal, that is not necessarily uh, focused on research but on communication and on about supporting people in expressing their own uh, life experience in a more uh, general sphere so um, yeah and to build new images actually so yeah I think uh, that was it and that the the the, the term of education we, we tend to see it more like a, a, company, a accompaniment, you know, to go together and, uh, and yeah, explore. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I have um, a question that I think it's the kind of question that everybody is asking in this moment, but it is still uh, anyway extremely uh, central in what we are experiencing. And how did this uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic situation affected your work uh, with this respect? Because 
uh, we started this project of training uh, professionals and um, uh, realizing laboratories, uh, participatory activities and laboratories at the beginning of this uh, uh, unexpected global event. And obviously this uh, forced us to totally change uh, the program in a way that allowed us to mm, basically deal with uh, uh, social interaction and uh, collaborative uh, uh, tools in a socially distanced modality. And this has definitely shifted a lot uh, the, the attention from what has always been uh, the typical interaction in, uh, in a local context to this new global dimension of distancing ourselves. Uh, from one point of view, this resulted also in us uh, doing some innovation in terms of uh, interaction. So it was also part of an interesting challenge for developing new tools and new modes of uh, uh, managing participation. From another point of view, it was definitely frustrating in terms of losing a lot of the, 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 uh, the contact, the, 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 the um, I would say the, 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 the physicality, the emotionality of, of our work. So I'd like to have a comment from both of you how this uh, 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 situation aff uh, affected uh, your work and how you see the, the future in terms of uh, uh, tools for engagement. Elena, you want to Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, okay. Um, well, uh, this is an interesting question. <laughs> uh, we actually, we had a lot of difficulties developing uh, the project during the COVID, I mean, after the first uh, wave uh, and etc. cetera, uh, because of the restrictions and because of the, um, because there was another, there was another concept of contact and uh, a bit of, well, fear uh, in it. Uh, and um, yeah, it is a, a barrier in a sense that um, what we had built until now was based on uh, physical contact and communication in a physical, in a physical environment. Uh, what we have tried to do is uh, like shift the um, shift the, the methodology and the products that we were um, envisaging into a more digital format. Uh, that's not always the, um, I mean, the, the digital culture, but uh, we also think that uh, there, are, there is potential in, um, in the digital world because, because it allows you to connect with people not only from the ter from the local territory, but people with similar views and uh, interests and uh, experiences uh, from all around the well, the globe. I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, this is an open question for for the museum too right now. So I don't know, Levante, if you have. Yeah, it, it's, I can say something similar because we see that, of course, most of our work and most of the, the communities that we work with, uh, their, you know, their activities are based on physical contact and, and uh, many of them didn't really have uh, any online or, or not much online presence before. I think some of them reacted very, very quickly and, and um, managed to move uh, a lot of activities online. And, and I think it's, it's again a bit depending on, uh, on local activist culture. In, in some places, digital tools are very embedded and, and you know, for the last decade, very widely used in others, not at all. So I think it's been a, a bit of a, a, bit of a you know, changing the dynamics of, of uh, how places are run. Also, in a way, opening it up and closing it down in the same time. Now, as Elena mentioned, that you you could join events and discussions without having to go there. You could be in another country. You could be somewhere else. You were the the the, the some of the thresholds that were there before were eliminated, and there were some new thresholds that were uh, different in nature. In the same time, what we also saw that some of our, our partner 
projects and initiatives, they obviously they had to rethink uh, their economic model completely. So they had to, you know, rein them themselves, which sometimes actually was a very useful thing because because it made them more uh, resilient on the long term. But also you could see how uh, how the the the, the fact that uh, well the, the if you had a community around you, that was actually very important assets in these cases because they helped you uh, survive in a moment when uh, a lot of places had to shut down a lot of places lost their uh, you know revenues so that was an important thing and and uh, and again i think it was quite important that that uh, in a way you could you could reach almost everywhere in the world if you if you uh, wanted to of course, it's a matter of language. It's a matter of a lot of lot of uh, other things. But uh, somehow, some of these events became, uh, and some of these discussions became very surprisingly open. No, so I think it it, it had a it had a, a lot of contradictory effects on on on, on our work. So I, I could be in uh, very interesting festivals that otherwise I would would have been able to do to go, but it was of course impossible to hang out after these you know webinars and online discussions and have a coffee and, and I actually got to learn about things that were not said there no so and i think it, it it was pretty much the dynamic in many initiatives and many many spaces as well thank you i will proceed with the last question that I would have loved to, to pose also to Laura, but actually I can't see her uh, appearing. I think she's stuck in another uh, uh, meeting. So um, I, I, think we, I think we should proceed definitely without her at this point. Uh, but anyway, the last question that I connect somehow also with this crisis moment and this, this uh, big shift that we had uh, towards the COVID, it's about the role of the public. We are discussing how basically it's essential to enforce communities in order to develop their uh, knowledge and their values and how to basically pulling as a commons uh, this kind of uh, research. But at the same time, the question is, how do we enforce the process of learning from context, uh, developing open resources uh, uh, that can be used uh, for educating and activating uh, uh, the local communities into practices? Can we do it without the public support? What is the role of the public in this uh, kind of process, uh, especially? in relation with this kind of uh, structural crisis moments in which you definitely need emergency support for developing uh, uh, responses. What is your, uh, uh, let's say, uh, mind about this, the role of public in it? Maybe I can start because it's uh, uh, in, in, in Hungary and, and uh, I think in Italy, some cities and, and, and different places where I, I've been involved. It's, it's a very contradictory issue because, because we can see that, uh, of course, the public should have a role and the public should have a, a supportive role in, in all these processes. But, uh, but sometimes it happens that the public sector is uh, not, not, of course, not as a whole, but the key institutions that are that are uh, you know making blows and and uh, distributing money they are openly hostile for uh, initiatives like community organization and bottom-up practices so in this case i think and this is what we've seen in the last 10 years in hungary it's uh, it's been you know the the desire from uh, activist scene and and the self-organized uh, well you know, communities that are taking care of heritage buildings uh, and in general, you know, building services that are not covered by the public sector. The, the main desire was, to, you know, to, to move as far for, as, as possible from the public sector, not to, to build a, a parallel welfare infrastructure and a parallel cultural infrastructure. A good example for this is a kind of a, an art biennale of, of biennale that is uh, has been organized already three times completely outside public structures. So it's, it's the whole point is to be outside of uh, the sphere of influence of the public sector. Of course, you cannot be completely outside because uh, the public sector can uh, influence private actors as well, but still, you know, to, to create a, a level of autonomy. And of course, when, when uh, 
hopefully this kind of situation and this kind of position gives a, a stronger resilience for these initiatives. On the other, other hand, I think it's much more healthy in a society where the public sector in a way represents uh, you know, public interests and then people can uh, have a level of trust. And then I guess uh, it is much more possible and, and desirable to build collaborations, for example, to talk about uh, the shared management of spaces, shared management of services, building governance structures where, you know, a municipality, for example, is involved, but it doesn't have the, the, the only say, no? So to build up governance structures where you have different actors around the table and they all have a say, and there's a, it's a formalized uh, distribution of power bet between different partners. So we've seen a lot of, lot of uh, very interesting uh, models for this. And, and again, the, the notion of the commons, no, it's very important to a little bit to underline this, that uh, we, can, we can think with public structures, public property, public ownership, but we can think uh, in, with the logic of the commons, which means that it's, not, it's no longer a, a municipal service or a municipal space, but it's, uh, it's something that is managed in a, in a shared way with different uh, actors and different organizations together. So I, I think we're moving hopefully towards a, a, an interpretation of the public, which doesn't mean that uh, it's, a, it's a full top-down uh, public provision of of, uh, of our city, but it's uh, or our cities, but it's more uh, uh, kind of moving towards the shared uh, governance and shared management idea. Yeah, I also agree. <laughs> in the sense that, uh, in the sense that public sector nowadays has a okay, not only nowadays, but has a responsibility because it has a power, and um, I think that um, that we see uh, how it is uh, now kind of changing, looking towards uh, these models because of because if not it will not be sustainable. And uh, yeah, from the point of view of the museum, uh, of I will say again, a local a small museum, municipal museum, um, the perspective is that uh, we don't try to go and uh, look to create new processes and um, like engage people, but to be engaged in, uh, in things that are going on and to listen to the, the groups that come uh, to the museum and uh, listen to what they need and what their objectives are uh, and try to support with the tools that we have, like um, to function like a kind of amplifier and a toolbox. And um, yeah, basically, th this is this is very important because uh, because it's, it is a different dynamics and uh, and because we think that there are learning the, the learning context is basically everything and the, the social processes have their own dynamics, so the role would be more of a of, of support than to. Uh, create something new. So yeah, I don't know if I if I have answered exactly, but answered, and I think that definitely this brings us to the necessary closing of this panel. We talked about a lot of, of uh, interesting topic. Uh, um, I think we can have a reflection uh, out of it of the fact that it's extremely necessary, this process of mapping and networking resources and different processes that are happening uh, all over. So somehow, yeah, I agree that it's I I important to build a public sphere, which is a distributed infrastructure, which is able to connect all those different experience and all those different knowledge and make them available to those that are actually uh, uh, working. I totally agree with the, the approach that was uh, underlined by Elena, the necessity not so much to create 
new project pathetically to go and to find what is happening on the territory and support it. And this comes also with the capacity of creating a social infrastructure which is able, flexible and able to connect also different struggles, different uh, uh, processes happening uh, at global le level. Connecting with the topic of this, uh, this technological shift and moving into the network, for sure, one of the positive aspects that was also highlighted by uh, Levente is definitely the fact that we are able more and more just to be part of what is happening in, in distant places and be together and share the, 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 the learnings from a lot of experience all, all over. And I think in this very little scale, the project Open CCCP tried to do this exactly, so to connect very different practices in different neighborhoods and to extract from them some kind of learning that can be used uh, 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 also by other, can be pulled, by, uh, can be uh, um, put together in, in building uh, common resources for uh, communities that are uh, living, struggling, transforming their uh, territories. Uh, for what regard uh, the missing voice of Laura, I hope that we may be, be include her for a moment when we are going to the next panel uh, discussing the, the, the local labs. For sure, it would be welcome her contribution, hoping that she can join us. And for the moment, I uh, close this uh, session. Uh, with a um, uh, great thank you to Elena and Levente for your uh, uh, super interesting contribution to this discussion. Thank, thank you very you much. Very much. <laughs>
something that worked in a specific neighborhood could work in another one and um, we, that our ideas could be shared and replicated and also why not you know we could work together and um, design collaborative work collaborative uh, projects um, yes and apart from that from a personal point of view I would like to outline that the course gave me the opportunity to reconnect with my city um, I've been working abroad for a long time and uh, I came back to Barcelona last year and for me doing the course was a great experience not only for all the learnings that, uh, that, I, that I took it, it was also um, the opportunity for me to reconnect with the people of my city with uh, the culture of my city and um, especially with the idea of um, how culture could be transformative and uh, could um, um, work for a better, a better place to live. Thank you, Sandra. That's inspiring. <laughs> Alex, please, could you, could you share with us uh, Iash's experience? Um, I, um, I represent the team of, of trainers in our, in our uh, labs. Um, I'm a social worker. As a, a social worker, I have over 20 years of experience in the field working with different vulnerable, vulnerable groups, but I've always done things in a way which fits my profession, and I think um, uh, that's a good thing. If they, you know, there's a good experience, uh, but I think you can always learn and expand, and this was the local labs were an opportunity for both us as a trainer or as trainers and the participants to expand their way of um, doing work with vulnerable groups. Um, in uh, Romania, we the participants were uh, students studying to become social workers or professionals uh, working for NGOs. Um, we selected as a main uh, topic, a main topic um, migration, and we uh, and on a first stage we uh, we introduced as much information about the situations of migration that characterize Romanian communities. We, we discussed the situation of children with parents working abroad, the situation of children returning from abroad back to Romania after a, a failed, in some situations, experience of migration. We uh, presented to the participants the situation of elders who are not being uh, or sometimes taken care of by their children because their children migrated. Um, we also discussed the, the, the new and fairly new phenomenon which characterizes Romania, which is having people coming over to Romania or through Romania to Western Europe. Um, so uh, again, this is a new topic for us and we try to uh, put as much from our experience in these discussions with the participants as possible. We made um, uh, the context was uh, very open. We, we um, uh, tried to answer questions uh, from uh, uh, the participants. Uh, we tried to bring in also guests. We um, also had to overcome the, the limitations imposed by the pandemic. Uh, we ran our um, labs at the end of last year and beginning of this year, so we could not uh, be as much within the communities that we targeted we uh, had to rely a lot on uh, digital tools uh, we learned a lot uh, in the project about using digital tools from each other again uh, from the participants we learned a lot of ourselves from our research and our participants became more patient and became more accustomed to these tools uh, which improved their uh, ability to analyze uh, situations and uh, to respond um, we divided the participants eventually into three groups. They had to do this digital approach of uh, learning about target communities and about vulnerable groups, and they had to uh, rely on uh, WhatsApp to talk to people from those communities or to talk to professionals from those communities, still separated, but trying to get as much into the community as possible. Um, and eventually they had to produce uh, uh, action plans uh, um, that were tailored to selected communities um, and specific action plans uh, for uh, children affected by the, the migration of their parents. 
um, because uh, it was it was a, a process. We started from the big. We started from um, many a, a, a very rich uh, topic, and then we went to a specific topic. We selected specific target groups. We focused on specific needs that were tailored to the group and to the community. So, and then another thing that was uh, interesting for us was not to rely on the formal institutions and resources of the community, but we included in the action plans informal institutions, uh, values, um, re people who were resources and who could uh, enrich our intervention in those communities. Thank you, Alex. Um, as, as Oscar told in the first part of the conference, one of the objectives was to have a curriculum that was, um, that was flexible and, and that could be adapted to different contexts. And I think this two first experience show that we can uh, implement this kind, of, this kind of, uh, of activities, this kind of trainings and this kind of community approaches um, within the same framework in very different topics and very different contexts. Um, I would very much like to introduce Jim from, from London to explain us what you did there. Thank you, Jim. Well, thank you, Mariana. Um, I am uh, part of City Mind, and our work is uh, in a disadvantaged neighborhoods in, in large cities. Um, I, I think it's important to understand what we try to do as City Mind before I, I dive uh, into the uh, concrete things we did in Somerstown. Um, what we enjoy doing is um, uh, work for a long time with with a, with a specific community because it takes enormous time to build trust. Um, trust comes on foot but leaves on horse, they always say. And, and I think that's what we learned over 20 years working in deprived communities. That is, uh, many come in, go out. We aim to stay there for a while. Um, I, um, our aim is always to develop with the local community a, a story on a specific topic. Uh, the, the, it's an artistic work in itself, but at the same time, it also challenges the status quo within that community. And it asks questions of power, who has the power and what can you do? Now, specifically what we did in Somerstown, one of the poorest neighborhoods in the UK still, unfortunately, is we wanted to work on food because food is heritage, is culture, is economy, is skills, uh, but it's also hospitality and conviviality. So it's a way to bring people together. And um, as I said, we, we like to start very, very slow, very uh, almost invisible, hardly a blip on the radar. And our idea for Summerstown was to uh, organize a lunch break club. This is at noon in the neighborhood at specific uh, places. We just invite people randomly to come have food with us. Invitations were left in shops on bicycles, on bicycle racks. If you had one, you could come. And the meetings were organized in uh, very unusual places. The basement of uh, Houseman's bookshop um, uh, on a boat on, in an old church. And the idea was just by um, uh, bringing people together to start a conversation on food and to see what we could do in a second stage. The second stage consisted of working in the courtyard of uh, a social housing block. This courtyard was hardly used, it was a lawn. And we managed to transform that into an allotment. Those are, uh, uh, we call that planters in London. Those are boxes uh, where you can grow vegetables in. And this, this was a second step into the uh, food story where we could grow uh, own foods. Uh, that was one bit of the story. The second bit was build the planters. That opened a new trajectory into skills where we involve people on the basis of the interest of learning to build things with wood, uh, construction, uh, lightweight construction. So that was a second stage, transform the inner courtyard into an allotment. This brought us into a third stage that is uh, still on hold now, basically. But the idea was to, with the building skills we developed with the uh, love for food, we would um, build a mobile kitchen based on what happened in the neighborhood before, based on stories we've heard. Uh, the object is designed and is being built bit by bit when the occasion presents itself. It's called the object of desire. But the overall aim is to bring skills together around a specific object uh, and to exchange skills. So there's no, no top-down learning, but peer-to-peer -peer learning. I think that's the story we wanted to share with our Somerstown intervention. 
Thank you, Jim. This is super interesting because it's also including this building uh, aspect during the lab, this, this uh, bringing skills together to really uh, have a hands-on activity, uh, which probably means a different level of engagement also of the, of the participants, and that's super interesting to, to discuss afterwards. Um, I would like to introduce Claudia uh, to explain us what, what was the lab uh, in, in Palermo about. Thank you, Claudia. I was one of the participants of a Cup Open Labs organized by Bondo Union. The labs focus on the use of the cultural heritage uh, to promote social inclusion in Cabo neighborhood uh, of Palermo. We started mapping uh, local uh, resources, and uh, in my case, my group worked with uh, different uh, religious community uh, of the Capo uh, that reflect the multiculturalism uh, of the city. Uh, it's uh, interesting the, uh, this experience because uh, after I wrote and uh, I won a fellowship, uh, which is a uh, Colle di Azione, uh, promoted by the Federal Europe Institute and uh, financed by the uh, Tokyo Foundation. Uh, this program supports human and social science projects, and my research concerns artistic practice, like a pedagogical device with, uh, um, uh, with Capo's children. Um, and uh, I, and uh, I based on a uh, mapping uh, uh, of the territory, the outdoor education, and as very my radical and uh, aspired uh, by radical pedagogy of uh, Danilo Dolci, Franco Lorenzoni, and the Bruno Munari method. Thank you, Claudia. Last but not least, uh, <laughs> I would like to, do, to introduce Luis Miguel. Uh, from uh, from Berlin, could you please, Luis Miguel, explain us a little bit what you what you lived in the lab in Berlin? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we organized this uh, this organized uh, this lab was organized uh, last year, and yeah, it was like a really interesting experience uh, because uh, as well the focus as as uh, all the rest of the cities have presented was pretty similar in the sense of like really. Uh, um, it was really like an interesting approach of really like seeing like this way of uh, learning about tools on how to implement these uh, more uh, roles of community activators and so on. And where we had like um, three labs uh, that basically we peer learned between like different, uh, um, yeah, it was like a really multidisciplinary background uh, from all the from all the participants, which was really enriching. We have like a first uh, a first module, which was uh, about socio spatial assessment of the area where we were, which was really really nice just to have a common understanding of the place that we were dealing with. Uh, and basically, it was really uh, focused on applying methodologies on tools that were already tested by uh, Tessere or that they were tested in in already different projects. Also, like um, mapping tools, like collaborative mapping tools, which it was it proved to be a little bit of a challenge given the online uh, limitations. But it was also like really interesting to see like the on, basically the online limitations on certain collaborative approaches, also to like the limit the physical and the online. And then we have like a third section on like storytelling, which also proved to be like super super nice. And it was uh, a whole course of like tools, uh, applied tools, conversational, getting a common understanding of the area we were working in, the limitations of the tools, and uh, very uh, fluid in that sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Luis Miguel. Um, I would, uh, Claudia's experience leads me to the, to, the, to the second question I have, uh, because of course, uh, the labs are meant to experience this kind of, of methodologies and, um, and uh, to, to learn some things, to share some things, to put in common, uh, but also to give you some tools to use in your professional life. So your experience is that 
based on this first experience in Capo, you started a, a, a very new project working, if I understood well, with children in the neighborhood. Uh, could you please explain us a little bit more what, what, what kind of, uh, of learnings led you to this idea of generating this, this, new, this new project and this new adventure, let's say? One of the most important things of the uh, project is the knowledge of the territory uh, that, for me, that uh, for me um, was the first time in uh, Palermo with these uh, Capo neighborhoods. Uh, usually I work uh, in a museum on uh, another uh, space, another territory of the city, but uh, the Capo uh, was uh, with the Capo Open Labs uh, was the first time. Uh, it's uh, so precious the um, support of uh, the team, so with uh, Paola, Giorgio, uh, Claudia, Giancarlo, uh, and the method uh, that uh, was the mapping the territory, uh, the observation, uh, and the relationship with the community. Uh, uh, that is so important to share uh, um, experience to work with uh, other uh, projects. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had several conversations over the two and a half years about where we come from and um, what kind of work we do and how we fit as organizations because sometimes we've seemed like we come from different places and we're separate enough. Um, and many of the partners spoke about recovering spaces and re uh, regenerating spaces. Um, in our case, this is something that we will look into in the future, but for us this project was about recovering relationships between people, social workers, so institutions of the community, bringing back actors which n for a long, too much, too long time now have took, taken a step back because they felt like their contribution is less important because they're not necessarily professionals, um, like churches, like um, community leaders who are now, uh, since you know, social services and social projects are becoming more and more organized and you know, put in certain, uh, up to certain standards, they feel like they don't live up to those standards. And uh, sometimes they take a step back and they don't, um, they don't see a place for themselves. So we focused in our uh, local labs on recovering those relationships because we tend to, uh, by, by, by putting things in standards, we tend to lose the humanity of relationships. Um, and we tend to put too much emphasis on certain schematics and uh, not enough re um, emphasis or lose the value of, of human connection. Um, in our project, we looked at some, some, some uh, aspects which were quite, let's say, measurable. Uh, children need certain skills in the absence of their parents, and we want to be the professionals who replace the parents and provide the skills to, to, the, to the children. In some situations, you don't have a choice. You have to have a professional replacing um, an, uh, an adult that uh, usually uh, develops those life skills in children. In some situations, you, if you make certain changes in the way the family is organized or in the way in, the, in which the community collaborates, those skills are built in a more natural way. So um, in our project, in our the three uh, plans that we came up with, we try to involve formal institutions like the school, the city, the social services, but I also wanted to bring in um, professionals from or from other uh, dimensions, from other areas, and also to bring in uh, the families, the uh, people, uh, the mem regular members of the community who wanted to provide, to give in, to give, uh, uh, to contribute to, to, to uh, which amounts to a better community and a better uh, way of looking after the children. So we focused on children but we, we wanted to rebuild and repair uh, relationships when we wanted to give value to, to other types of actors which now appear to um, be less regarded as important in, in such a context. 
or at, at, at least appear, not necessarily uh, that they are. Um, so we focused a lot on, on, on that. We focused a lot on uh, how to create, uh, how to make this, uh, these labs an experience for the participants because you know it's hard to do that through a screen and how to hard to um, uh, um, give an experience, uh, real experience or uh, an experience that is similar to what would have happened had we not had the <laughs> the pandemic. Our plan, initial plan was to take the participants to communities to talk to institutions to talk to uh, and informal actors and it would have been a completely different experience. Uh, we learned a lot, as I said, on how to use digital tools, but we also learned that, you know, the pandemic cannot beat you because you can always find a way to, to, to uh, you know, you can bring people in to talk about their experiences, like, like you gave an example earlier, uh, professionals who can answer specific questions, who can relieve specific fears of future professionals was because one question, one situation that we had to address was, at some point, uh, the, the participants asked, will we be able to do this job? Because we speak a, of a lot of problems. We speak of, of, of serious um, things. And are we, will we be prepared enough to accommodate those fears? And by bringing in, bringing in our experience and bringing in other professionals, we could answer specific questions and uh, you know, alleviate some of those fears. So we try to uh, make it as, as, as close to the reality as possible. We try to uh, encourage them to get that information uh, that they needed for the action plans uh, through various means, through going through you know, regular research and through contacting regular people in the community, those actors that we, we wanted to value and to uh, also to, to uh, connect with their parents who are back in those communities and neighbors and kind of, you know, take it from the theoretical to the, I, we can actually do <laughs> uh, uh, plan. Um, this, this makes me think the two completely different things, no? One is you as professionals are uh, using this or learning from this to rebuild um, uh, relationships. And Sandra spoke before that as a personal experience, it was useful to rebuild her relationship with a neighborhood, with a city, with her own culture. So this professional, this professional and personal perspective, it's, it's kind of difficult to separate, but in, it's interesting that you can use these this, this topics or these methodologies and that can be useful both for both uh, scenarios, let's say, for your own personal life or for your professional professional approach. Um, so that was one thing I, I was thinking, and the other one, I just, <laughs> it, it left my mind just a minute ago, so when it comes back, I'll, I'll introduce it again. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I would like Jim to, to tell us a little bit, because it's also um, um, interesting to, uh, to hear from Alex uh, this rebuilding relationships uh, through digital tools. It's, 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 it's a complicated scenario. It should have been in another way. Probably it would have been very different. Uh, anyway, you did it and it's, and it's great. Um, uh, you, Jim, you didn't, you, you didn't went through the screens. You went directly to work with the, with the communities. And I would like to, to to stop them for a moment for, with this with this engagement you know, uh, of, of the of the community in the kind of lab you you developed. Um, I love it when you think of me when you draw a blank, Mariana. That's very good. <laughs> um, uh, what I wanted to say was indeed uh, what we took out of the uh, uh, process. I think was uh, a bit in the. Um, um, let's say we didn't realize that certain things we did could be toolified, let's call it that. It could be reused by other people. And that's something that came out of the dialogue, particularly with Alex, who's on the other side of the specter, I think, in the sense of he's a trained social worker. His uh, profession is almost to bring communities together. In our work, it's, it's sort of a, a positive fallout of the work we do. And he, he particularly dialogues with him, allowed me to see that if you would put push our work to just one more level of abstraction, it could reach 
that could be reused again, which was the whole onset of this project, that is uh, online tools that could be reused again. So that worked very well. Um, what also was very useful, I think, is this dialogue uh, clarified a uh, process within CityMind and our work of thinking within London. And that is um, where initially we were, uh, I, I like to use the reading of social capital in that sense, where initially we were very much dealing with bonding social capital, bringing communities together, disparate fragmented groups, uh, bringing them together and do things to, to create cohesion. Then we realized that there's several communities who not necessarily link up with each other. In our particular case, there's Bangladeshi community, there's an Irish community, there's an Italian community, and that's called a bonding social capital. That's uh, link those different groups together, uh, connect them rather. But then there's a third group, and that's where Alex was uh, referring to now, I think, that is uh, linking social capital. That is those communities link them to the powers and structures that shape their life and start a dialogue with them. Uh, so this third discussion is what we're trying to do now, and that is uh, show that we can create a community of communities, talk to people that shape our neighborhoods. I think that's a process that emerged from being invited to, forced to, you pick the words, Alex, <laughs> be more explicit in what we do, do it less intuitive, more expressed, more translated into tools. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I was thinking. So. To listen to your thoughts, Jim. <laughs> um, uh, Luis Miguel or Emma, would you like to, to, to share with us your, your experience? What kind of, of learning, or, or, or what do you keep from this, from this lapse to your professional life and or personal life, as we see the, the line is a bit diffuminated? Um, what kind of learnings and what do you keep from this from this experience from the lab? Um, do you want to go first, Emma, or well, I can I can maybe also like a start and then uh, you can also add. Um, yeah, I mean, like uh, I I totally agree with this personal intersection uh, of uh, how to understand the the community and how to relate to it because also like at the end. Uh, the first lab, which we managed to still do uh, uh, offline, so we were present, we were walking around the neighborhood, we were like inquiring with uh, different perspectives into it and then coming together, a uh, different group. Uh, one group were more focusing on gender aspects, other more on heritage, understood in many different ways. So it was about bringing together this understanding that really created like this feeling of like actually loving the neighborhood, understanding the complexity, the complexity of it and really like connecting with this also like what Levente said before, this uh, devotion that actually at the end you really need to have to actually put the time or the effort to activate such a, uh, to navigate this, this complexity. So uh, in this sense, it really like dives into the complexity in a way that it really makes you feel that, um, you can navigate this complexity and you can move further and it's always going to be like full of uh, yeah, just like um, uh, a complexity of other stuff but you can still like find the ways in which to connect create common understandings and uh, be on top of these uh, structures so yeah for me that was uh, really inspiring I would also say that uh, even for me the very most interesting thing is the ability to go as deeper as possible in the understanding of city's complexity. And this compared with the tools that Tessere teaches us and that we also made together was the very uh, strength point, I would say, about the course we had in Berlin. I think I think you missed the, the mic. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, um, just saying that uh, as I hear and as I listen what you explain, I would very much invite the participants to have a look on what we have on the website because uh, there you will find 
uh, more in deep probably explanations of what we did on the lab, but also in the, in the, in the OER, in the curriculum, there are lots of links to tools uh, that were used in the, trainings, um, in the trainings that are very useful to, as you say, I love this, this, this way of putting it, to navigate into the complexity of, of, um, of a territory. Um, I, would, I would like to ask Sandra because she, she has a background of community um, work, let's say, in another context in, in Ireland. Um, so what, was, uh, what, do, what is your gain in this, in this, mm -hmm. in this learning uh, process, in this lab? What did you get as a professional? Mm -hmm. um, or, or what did we add probably mm -hmm. to, your, to your experience? Yeah, I mean, um, a good selection of, of learnings that um, the course added to my existing skills. But also, I think it was a reaffirmation of the belief that the basics of community engagement is listening to people. Mm -hmm. You know, that um, if you want to design, create community projects, you need to listen to the participants and you need to listen to their ideas to their thoughts and and then create together that project. I always um, I always tried to, tried to work with with that idea of people could be active collaborators of the creation of culture. You know that I oh I have a brilliant idea and I want to do it. I need participants. I think it's the other way around. I think it's hi participants. What would you like to do? And we can do it together. So um, I think it was a reaffirmation of, of that um, idea, I think basics of engagement, which is listening to people and then um, considering their thoughts and their interests in order to create a meaningful project, a meaningful and relevant project to them so they can feel ownership at the end of the project. Um, in terms of the additions, um, many especially especially for me it was the process the process was very important um, i'm a process person mm -hmm. and um and i think a process professional and i really enjoyed um learning the structure um not because i didn't know how to do it because, but just because i wanted to compare that the structure that i was used to follow as you said in a different context because it, it, it's a different country um was similar, almost exactly the same. Um, and that was a reaffirmation of, um, as I said, my existing skills, but also, okay, that's the structure they follow here. So we're doing the same work, we're following the same values, and, and we're obtaining maybe similar results. Um, so structure, methodology, and as I said earlier, um, I think having the opportunity to listen to professionals from different areas of culture or education, and as Alex said earlier as well, um, listening to how people overcame difficulties and, and issues that might come up during a process um, is really is a relief. Because sometimes you have different scenarios and um, especially this type of work that you don't know what's going to happen because you can have a perf a, uh, the perfect project plan or the perfect structure, but we are working with people and we, we are always changing things. So um, listening to different experiences um, and uh, different, um, I don't want to say problems, but issues that came up and that people knew how to deal with them, how to deal with them and how to solve them, I think was, was really, um, really interesting. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. That's uh, something we usually say. We, you start this process, this kind of processes with an idea. You know where you start, but you never know where, where you will end. You yeah. have, a, you have a, a basic plan to go from A to B, but you never know if you go straight ahead or just do it like this. Uh, basically, we could, because you are collaborating, you are co-creating, you are, as you say, working with humans. So uh, yeah, 
of course. We're working with humans, <laughs> so yeah, that's and we're working with emotions as well. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you make people, um, when you include people in the making of something, you are giving people ownership and you're giving people sense of um, sense of pride as well. You know, because we we've we've been part of this project, mm -hmm. so th these are emotions as well. So I think it's very important um, to to keep in mind that some projects can create an impact on people's lives that sometimes we are not aware of. That, you know, for us is let's do a project with, with this community group. And maybe for the community group, for the participants, that project means so many things that you're not aware of. So we're creating an impact. So we're definitely working with humans and emotions. Alex, I would love if you if you add your perspective because we've we've talked about this this stereotype of the social worker that's behind a desk and filling in forms and a bit a bit a bit away of emotions and a bit away of 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 this of this kind of work. So probably the addition that, comes from this side. <laughs> yeah, well, there are different social workers, and some of them are in the middle of things and always there and they already have always have a problem with their bosses so tell them that they're behind with the paperwork that they're supposed to do and they're also <laughs> the social worker that is always behind the desk or more behind the desk than in the middle of the community and we find that aside from the obvious um, there are many downsides to focusing on the on on, on filling in paperwork and uh, focusing on the, on on the administrative part because you're missing out on resources that could really help you do your job better. Um, in, in, in good social workers have connections in the community with, with relevant actors who can always step in and say, I also have an interest in your, you know, the, the, the objectives that you have in your work and maybe we can do it, work together and maybe we can uh, uh, achieve our objectives together and it's, putting resources in common, it's activating people who can, who can act, help you that the social worker that focuses on administrative part is, misses, is missing out on. So um, the, 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 um, the message that we're uh, um, passing on to the participants to the local labs, and we're trying to include that in the local um, uh, plans as well, is that you will always find resources to do your work if you're out there and if you're connected to the community and of course i'm not saying that the the paperwork is not important it is always it's paramount but that then that, that we need to uh um yeah get out there and 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 balance out uh our uh need for <laughs> filling in paperwork uh with the the need to be connected to the community. Um, there are two things, two things that I'm taking out of this project for me personally, and one is the reaffirmation that the examples do have power. And I think by listening to, the, to our partners, giving out examples of how they managed to get people to um, get involved in community projects, small community projects, bigger community projects, uh, those examples inspired me, and I think uh, that's one level. The other level is the examples that work for the people in the community. If somebody is out there doing cleaning up their area, others might step in and do the same because they also want a clean uh, piazza in front of their uh, or clean area in front of their house. So it's it's the, the examples of the people in the community, but also it, it can be something small, an example like that, or it can be. Uh, as, as an example, a concrete example that enables you to to to, to say, to, yeah, actually, it, it empowers you because you now have the skills, but also gives you hope, and it gives you a positive outlook on things, and it, it's really really powerful. So that the part of example is one thing that I'm taking, and the other one, uh, the other thing is that uh, I, I learned a lot from the participants that uh, on how to. Uh, from from the, the other members of the of the partnership uh, on how to get people to become uh, to 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 join you in in the type of projects that affects the lives of everybody, and that you're not 
immediately and directly interested in. Like, for instance, in the work of the social worker, the family usually is motivated by an issue that they have in their own families that they would like to participate. In, in the examples that I learned about in, in, this, in this project, it, the community had an issue, but it's hard to get people out of their homes to come and participate and stay engaged in projects that uh, concern everybody, but they're not really that close to the to the skin, <laughs> as as in other the other situations. So, I think it's important to be out there, uh, but also it's important to be able to get people involved close to you uh, as a resource or as a partner, as a collaborator. I think it it really uh, broadens your your um, your uh, work. And uh, I would, I would, uh, I would like to hear a little bit more, Claudia, about this new project you're, you're starting because this is a concrete result of your participation of a of a local lab. As as far as I understand, you're working with children in the neighborhood. So what what kind of what kind of um, of project is it? What kind of activities are you doing with these children? Which is the the approach you're you're developing? Um. Yes, I work. Uh, yeah, I work with the children of uh, the Capo neighbor. Um, I think that uh, these um, little human are uh, so precious. Um, they are like uh, a seeds, uh, and this moment uh, um, I feel like a gardener. <laughs> with uh, these children that are an important uh, resource for the territory, for the community. Uh, they are the future. Um, and this uh, period I worked uh, with a, an artist, an illustrator, that's called uh, um, Alessandra Di Paola. Uh, we worked um, about uh, the awareness of the bodies in the space and the care of the world um, against the, viol the, uh, the violence uh, of the language that uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes or always, they use in a... Uh, um, in their life, because the Capo is a, is a neighborhood so difficult. They, um, um, the Capo is in the center of the city, the historical center. Uh, so if you are a tourist, you go to Mercato, uh, you can see some uh, church, uh, um, but at the same time, uh there are um, so many difficult in uh, the life of the um, the community so it's uh, so it's so interesting work with uh, this difficulty and um, grow up with the uh, with these children uh, and uh, in the school um it's more important, um, it's so important to work with the school uh, because with the school we can uh, do a uh, work um, with uh, a method of uh, uh, radical pedagogy and uh, with um, outdoor education. Uh, so the school open the, uh, the, uh, the door and uh, go out uh, uh, to the to the neighborhood to see the difficulty the real life uh, I don't know if, uh, if uh, in your country is the same but uh, in Italy the school is uh, really closed uh, so this project uh, uh, try to open the door <laughs> And the mind, I think. <laughs> I super, super interesting. Um, I would like to 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 just address uh, uh, something that went by very very fast in the description of the Berlin Labs. That's the storytelling thing because we are 
working with communities, we are uh, co-creating, we are, but then there is a whole storytelling about these processes. And I would like to, to ask uh, uh, Luis Miguel or, or Emma, what's your impression about this, the importance of this, uh, of this part of the processes, of this, of this uh, storytelling approach, let's say, or methodology? I think that um, the storytelling side was one of the most difficult, I would say, just because um, it was a bit complicated to realize first what we did and then also to try to communicate it at the best. Because actually we really tried to touch what was the tangible and intangible side of um, the local common heritage. So yes, also trying to to give back and to give feedback to, to the community was um, very, I would say, struggling sometimes because you don't, because you don't, you're not sure if you're doing the best. And yes, we actually mapped an entire neighborhood and tried to go very deep and also to break out with some dynamics, canonical dynamics of um, CT analysis. And so we try to give back a different view of the Schoenberg um, side, area of Berlin. Then um, I would also add something about the creation that about the, the collaborative atlas we made. And it was, um, I would say, very uh, interesting because we really built the, the tool and also add there some cards and something which could be very useful to to understand the work we did so this was a very um touch point with the external communities about the work we did and um, of course it could be implemented and it's a collaborative tools and it's something which bring together um, the collaborative uh, system and also um, the open source and the, the implemented tools for mapping cities and also to trying to involve the inhabitants and trying also to give them the right voice and the, some place to, to, to make some narrative about their, their own cities. I think it's very important. Thank you, Emma. We're almost, we're almost uh, finishing. Uh, we would like to keep into schedule. I would like to introduce Laura from Tessere. She's, she's uh, joined us a bit, uh, a bit after the starting. Um, and I would like you, Laura, if possible, to have um, to a bit, a bit away of what we're talking about, about the concrete things we did in the labs. I would like to know um, a bit uh, your your impression, or, or 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 what would you say about the role the public uh, authorities regarding heritage in this kind of and this kind of processes we're talking about? That was one question, and of course, if you want to add any general comments uh, of what you have heard, you're open to do it. Oh, okay, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon by now to everyone. Um, so it's really hard to, you know, to have a comment that encompasses everything that you said. But uh, I just uh, pick a couple of uh, in, a couple of uh, ideas when you were speaking about this small project. One was uh, around education, and one was about how to link um, um, like a spontaneous or community-led uh, initiatives, especially in. Uh, complex and the, the private urban areas with municipalities. So I happen to work as a, the previous speaker, uh, Levente Poliak with Orbacht, and, and you know, many of you know this, is a program that tries to bring together a different size of civil society with, um, with uh, public authorities. Um, I just want to make an example of one of the cases that I've been uh, following. Uh, it's a very concrete example. Um, there was a, a city in uh, uh, nearby Barcelona is uh, called uh, L'Hospitalet de Lobregat. Maybe you know some of uh, some of you know it. 
So uh, apparently it has uh, like a 30% of the population as a migrant background. And uh, especially in one area where the one of what we will call uh, the private urban areas, much more complicated than others. And 2000, around 2010, a group of um, activists or parents and people from the area, they started to complain that the schools were not fitting the needs or the cultural development. We call it, we, I don't use the word heritage, heritage. We talk more generally in terms of culture. And so from this protest, um, they succeeded somehow to create a music school, but it's not a mu normal music school. It is, it's called MK School. It's a performative art school. You probably know this school. Um, uh, and uh, they, they created a format in which people that don't, families, they usually don't, they don't have the means or to pay for, um, for tuition fees for, for schools, they can land, lend the instruments, they can learn instruments, they can go, they can create theater, they can have different forms of performative expression that are also related to the neighbor, neighborhood. So this idea which per se, you may say, well, it's a neighborhood initiative, it created a different school, but also it created a different sense of proud in the community, in the municipalities. And it started to upscale. So you you work with fam first with kids, and then with families, then with the teacher, then the public authorities. And the public authorities create out of this small idea of coming from the protest, protest they created um, uh, sort of a, a model. And so this model now grew also internationally, obviously with all the lights and shadow, but it grew internationally, creating a net of other cities that learn from it. That was uh, Jim was saying, you know, how do you do you create a tool? Do you create a, a method? But what do you, how do you exchange? How do you transfer ideas or readapt these ideas? Is very very important. How do you readapt the 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 small experiment that you do locally with the community? You tell the stories of this um, small experiment through what Emma was saying. So well, we had a network which was called on stage which was amazing. So you had like different cities uh, collaborating with one, one another and redesigning this idea of multicultural um, performative art school. Uh, and then this whole idea grew up with a partnership of um, um, inclusions of migrants and refugees. It became sort of um, an interesting ideas to be, to be further shared. And so that's why uh, why the small scale action, I would say, are very important because they, they can grow horizontally in the sense of including so many different uh, other actors, what we call community, but community is not existing. It's something like the kind of uh, networking that you create locally that we all somehow try to work with it. And then trying to change, and this is what uh, I was asked to say in the last panel that I'm, I'm sorry that I had to base because of a contemporary um, meeting at the same time. So this is uh, the hope at least to push towards uh, changing the existing policy in a way that becomes the be at European level in a way that become more uh, permeable uh, to innovation at the very local level and permeable in the way that also small scale action have the space in address in accessing appropriate funding and uh, just to conclude was I was asked to say about the culture and cultural heritage partnership for instance one of the action there are 11 actions i'm not going to tell about these actions of this european partnership one of them is to change the regulation in a way that structures like commons or civic uses um, 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 regulation that have been experimented by some cities bringing together local actors and municipalities are also accepted at European level. So to say every tiny little grain that is, uh, uh, that is uh, um, blossoming at the very local level with in individual action with small projects they create the the future plan that can be used by anyone else i don't know if the metaphor is working but this is the idea that sort of uh, 
you know, trying to bring together what you are saying with the perspective I have uh, now working more at the level of governance with uh, European institutions and international organizations. I hope that uh, that was fitting what you were saying. <laughs> Very interesting, and, and of course we're super proud because we're right now in in L'Hospitalet de Llobregat. We're happy that you used this example of a, of a, of a best practice of the city we're sitting in. So, <laughs> uh, I didn't know that. I was I thought that you were in Barcelona, so I thought moved, well, you may know yeah. the place. <laughs> we moved. We moved just before the pandemic, and we are now in Planta Uno, which is this fantastic space we have in L'Hospitalet, open to uh, different uh, processes and ideas and failures also. So we're, we're very happy to be here. And we're very close to MCA too, so it's nice to hear it from you that you didn't know. Um, now we're closing. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Paola from Bond of uh, Mariana, Union. To, Mariana. Oh, sorry, yeah. Mariana, could I just make one short remark? You could. Uh, I, I tried to speak faster with my intervention so I could do this. <laughs> no, I, I think at the, um, this is probably the, the last time we um, show our face in this project. So at the set of sun, maybe it's good to, to share two thoughts with you. One, one uh, a tribute and gratitude, um, uh, because this has been an exceptionally bumpy ride, I think, uh, this project. Um, started off strange when uh, we all considered it failed. I don't know if you remember way back at the start. And then there were some signatures missing and then we resuscitated the project. So uh, there was hope again. And then meanwhile, we had to deal with the, the loss of our dear friend, uh, Juan, who was the instigator of this whole process. And uh, that's the person I wanted to pay tribute to now as well. Uh, so I wanted to pay homage to Juan as a, as a first idea. And um, well, our thoughts will be with him. And I hope that uh, we can honor his, his, uh, his um, legacy by continuing this type of work. And then the second thing, um, the project okay. stayed bumpy all the way through, um, particularly for the London uh, team where we had to deal with Brexit, first of all. So that made things very bumpy. Uh, overseas people returned back to their roots. So the team was very much shaken up. And when we started finding our bearings again, then there was COVID. And um, so it kept being very, very confusing. So I think uh, the, the success of this project is really a testament to the consortium that um, uh, Transit, Tessere and City might have been working together for some time. We had a track record, uh, Laura, Lorenzo and me go back to the previous century. So I don't know, Laura, if that makes us heritage in ourselves, but uh, we go back a long way. And I think Alternative Sociale and Bond of Union carry their weight very well in this project and they showed exceptional resilience and, 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 and involvement in the project. So this that brought it to where we are now. So uh, there's a final thank you, particularly to uh, Mariana and Oscar, I want to share also, because conditions have been very challenging and they managed to do it without creating too much stress and strain and even safeguarding a large part of the budget other people would have considered lost. So thank you very much, muchas gracias. And on that, I give the word back to you, Mariana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. You, you, you always make me sensitive. <laughs> now we're really, we're really closing. So, Paola, please, if you want to share some closing words. Wow. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks uh, to you, Mariana and Oscar, as a coordinator of the project. Uh, this event, this conference, uh, closed uh, this two year and a half experience with OpenCGCP. Uh, despite the, the COVID uh, pandemic and all the trouble uh, and change in our life we were going through the last half and I, uh, one and a half year, uh, I think we reached very successful results in terms of uh, educational resources and uh, moreover in terms of uh, uh, practices during the local labs. Um, and especially I think that the experience of this project uh, uh, confirmed the role of uh, uh, local culture as uh, enabler and activator of social change, as uh, we also could listen from the experience of the participants of the labs, and also the importance and the relevance of uh, the learning from contest approach. Uh, I'm sure that uh, all of us as partners uh, uh, will continue uh, by developing projects and also practices uh, on, uh, on this important uh, 
role of uh, local community and, uh, and their resources. I want to thank uh, all the participants uh, of the conference uh, and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much, all of you. And thank you for listening and thank you for following all this, all this experience. Well Bye. done. Well done, everyone. Bye.